أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A second for the love of Imam Al-Hassan and Imam Al-Hussein A third for the love of Fatima Al-Zahra with your loudest voices When we study the life of Fatima Al-Zahra Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha We see many aspects She was the greatest scholar she was the greatest worshipper. She was the greatest struggler, so to speak, meaning in jihad. There were many aspects to her life. And in every field, in any good field, Fatima al-Zahra alayha, was at the forefront. Among the things that we notice about the life of Fatima al-Zahra was that she was an exemplary wife as well. She was the best wife. The night of her wedding, Amir al Mu'minin, uh, the night of her wedding to Amir al Mu'minin, as we mentioned this a few nights ago, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam tells Amir al Mu'minin, he tells him, Ya Ali, Ni'ma zawj Fatima. Fatima is the best wife. Know her value. You're not marrying an ordinary person. She's the best wife. And because she was the best wife, and because Amir al-Mu'mineen was the best husband, it is obvious, it is logical that their marriage would be the most successful marriage. It was a marriage based on love, based on companionship, based on friendship, based on mutual respect. We'll talk about this in further detail, inshallah, towards the end of the lecture. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, some of you are married, some of you are not married, thank God for that. But all of you, at the end of the day, you will all get married, inshallah. Today, a happy marriage, a perfect marriage, has become something very rare that only exists in the movies. And the stories that we hear about our, about, of our grandparents. But as for a real, genuine, happy, successful marriage, today it's very rare. Whether it's amongst Muslims or non-Muslims. Whether it's, among, it's in the East or in the West. A happy marriage, a successful marriage is something very, very rare to find. Did you know that this year alone, uh, I'm sorry, last year, 2011, in Iraq, there were over 800,000 cases of divorce. We're talking about a population of no more than 25 million. 25 million. There were 800,000 cases of divorce in Iraq alone. This is our communities. Many of Many of the marriages are ending disastrously. disastrously. There are many reasons. If you want to take, talk about why a marriage ends in divorce and fails, there's lots of reasons. We'll stay here till Fajr talking about this. 
But I'd like to choose a specific area tonight. A specific aspect of why some marriages don't work out. And this is a general subject. It'll benefit you whether you're married or not married or you choose whether you choose to get married or not. One of the fundamental problems is that men and women don't understand one another. Men think in a specific way. Women think in a different way. Men and women don't think the same. And their needs are not the same. And their desires are not the same. Men, are, men and women are very different. That is why the Quran says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَطْوَارَ Or وَخَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارَ We have created you differently. Completely different. The way a man thinks, his ambitions, his goals, his desires are completely different from what a woman thinks, what she desires, what she wants. And where does the problem arise? When a man thinks that a woman thinks similarly, thinks like him. When a husband expects his wife to think like him and to want what he wants. And when a wife expects her husband to think like her and to want what she wants. This is a problem. When men and women don't understand one another, they don't get each other's thoughts, they don't get each other's desires and needs, you'll have a problem. I remember a few years ago, I don't know how many years ago, a movie came out called What Women Want, starring Mel Gibson. And it's an interesting movie because it's about a guy who, who's, I don't know what happens to him, he's hit with thunder or something, and all of a sudden he's able to read the minds of women. And all of a sudden he becomes a king. Why? Because he knows exactly what women want, how they think, and he begins to get involved to get involved in relationships, successful relationships, and he becomes a king. This shows you that men think completely differently, and women think completely differently. Tonight, inshallah, I will choose five points in which men and women are different in. Five various points and show the differences between men and women, God willing. Number one, motivation. What motivates man is completely different from what, what motivates a woman. What drives a man is different from what drives a woman. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, especially my sisters, men are simple creatures. They're not complicated. They're very simple in their thinking and in their desires and in their needs. Their goal is one, and that is their career and, op and occupation. A man cares about who he is, meaning what title he has, <clears throat> whether he's a doctor or physician or an engineer or a CEO or a speaker or the head of a committee. He has a goal. He wants to be someone. Number two, he cares about how to be that someone. What is it that he has to do to be that someone? whether it's a CEO or a doctor or, or an engineer. And number three, how much will he be making as that someone? Men are raised ever since their children to think that way, to worry about their career, to be someone when they grow up, to be a positive member in the community, to be someone that his family Specifically, his father and mother will be proud of. Thus, 
His mind is always preoccupied of reaching his goal in these three places. Who he is, what he does to be that someone, and how much he's making. His focus is completely on that. Because ever since he's, he's a child, he's told you have to be strong, you have to be successful, you have to make us proud, you have to honor the name and, and last name of your family, you have to be the breadwinner in your family, and so on and so forth. So this child, this young man, as a child, is raised with so much pressure on his, so on his shoulders to become someone. That is why his focus will always be on achieving these three goals. If he doesn't achieve these three goals, this man will feel as if he's a failure, as if he's a joke, because society is judging him based on these three places, who he is, what he does, and how much he's making. Look at your lives right now. The young men in your community, we judge them according, who, according to what, what they do and who they are and how much they make. Now, is this fair or not fair? Put this on the side. We're not talking about what's fair and not fair. We're talking about what's reality. We judge our men according to who they are. We don't judge our women to who they are, according to who they are. This is very important. Our women in our community, we don't, we don't judge them according to what position they have and what they do for a living and how much they make for a living. We judge our men according to these standards. Thus, this puts a lot of pressure on men. This puts a lot of pressure on a man to be the man that he wants to be. To be proud of himself and to make his family proud of himself and to make sure that when other men and other people in the community judge him, they judge him in a fair way, in a good way. Now ladies, this might help you understand why some men come late from home. They come late home from work. No, he's not cheating on you. Well, I mean, he could be, but usually he's not. Most likely he's occupied with what he's doing, with, ach with achieving that goal. This might help you understand why he has mood swings. Because his mind is preoccupied. Maybe this might help you why, understand why he doesn't give you attention. Because his mind's preoccupied. You see, one of the differences between men and women is that men can only focus on one thing. They can't focus on anything else. Anything else. When a man is watching TV, no matter how much you try to talk to him, he's just not going to pay attention. Because his mind is on, on the television. If he's reading a book, Khalas, his mind is on the book. But women, subhanAllah, Allah has given them a gift. They can focus on several things at one time. A friend of mine says that I came back home once and I saw my wife cooking, holding the baby in her hand, talking on the phone, and watching a tur Turkish series all at the same time. <laughs> this is possible. They could do it. I don't know how. We can't do it. Men can only focus on one thing at a time. It's illogical to expect a man to focus on his family and on you and on your needs and desires and wants and at the same time try to achieve his goal in these three places. Who he is, what he does, and how much he's, and how much he's making. What you could do instead is help him achieve his goal in these three places. Help him become the man he wants to become. Help him do the things that he has to do to be that person. Help him achieve his goal in making the amount that he wants to make. In helping, in helping him do so, you're actually helping yourself in having a stable, happy marriage life.
This is number one. Number two, a woman's love versus a man's love. Both men and women are capable of loving because the Quran says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Allah has put amongst you love. Mawadda is love. That means both men and women are capable of loving. However, the way they portray and express their love is completely different. Women have their own way of expressing their love and showing their love. And men have their own way of expressing and showing their love. But some people don't get it. Some women don't get it. They say, he doesn't love me. My husband doesn't love me. My fiancé doesn't love me. Why? Because she's expecting him to express his love the same way she expresses her love for him. This is wrong. This is wrong. Because men and women express their love totally differently, in different ways. A woman's love is more like a mother's love. It's warm, it's compassionate, it makes you feel secure, it makes you feel good. When a woman loves a man, she gives him her entire heart. She's willing to do anything for him. She's willing to walk over water for him. She's willing to speak to him all night long until she loses her voice or he loses her mind or he loses his mind. She's willing to do all that. She treats him like her own son. In reality, a woman's love is much like a mother's love. When a woman loves someone, she will treat him like her own son. Just like a mother treats her son. And she expects the man to treat her the same way. The same way she expresses her love, that warm, compassionate, generous love, she expects it from him as well. So she would probably expect him to call a lot, to give her a nickname, to cuddle, hold hands 24 hours a day, change diapers without having her to ask him, wash the, dish, wash the dishes without having her ask him to do so. No, my dear sisters, this is unrealistic. Men have the capability of loving and they do love. Men do love. Yet they have a different way of showing their love. They have a different way of expressing their love. When a man loves you, he's not necessarily going to take you out shopping every day. Or he's not necessarily going to be holding your hands all the time. Or cuddle or whatever. No, no, no. But he's going to do something else. What is he going to do to show his love? Number one, he's going to provide. When a man loves, he's going to provide for his family. Because a man, ever since he's a child, he's taught to provide. He's taught that he has to be the one to provide in the family, not anyone else. And it's a taboo and a shame for him to accept for his companion, for his spouse to contribute. It's a taboo. He has to provide. He has to be the one bringing the cash at home. He has to be the one bringing the bread at home. Thus a man shows his love and expresses his love by providing. He might not call. He might not call you teddy bear. He might not give you a nickname. But when he provides and he gives all that he has, he's expressing his love. He's showing you how much he loves you. Because when a man genuinely loves, he's not going to hide his cash. He's not going to hide his money. He's going to make sure that every pound, every dollar, every cent, every penny that he makes, it's all for his family. It's all for his wife and it's all for his kids. He's not working from morning till night to make a living for his neighbors or his friends. He's doing it for his wife. 
He's doing it for his children. Thus, when a man loves his wife, he's going to provide everything. There's not going to be a barrier. In fact, if you have needs, and he has needs, and he has needs, I mean financially, he's going to give a priority to your needs before his, if he loves. This is number one. He will provide. Number two, he will protect. A man that loves will protect the woman that he loves. He will protect her. He will protect her from danger. He will protect her from an enemy. He will protect her. He will provide protection. A man that loves will never allow his woman to be in danger. Will never allow his woman to be in an inappropriate position. Now when I say protect, I don't necessarily mean that he's going to be carrying a gun, walk behind you, and protect you from a thief or a murderer. No, 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 no. Protection can come from anything. He will make sure that no one hurts you. Not just physically, even verbally. He will make sure that no one will disrespect you. No one will hurt your feelings. A man that loves will do that. He'll do that. He'll make sure that no one hurts you. He will make sure that you're always safe and you're always healthy. A man that loves and his, for example, his wife is ill, will be willing to take his wife to the hospital in the middle of the night. Even if he has to get up in, at six in the morning to go to work. Because this is protection. This is what he does. This is how he expresses himself. This is how he expresses his love. He provides and he protects. When a man is providing and protecting, to him, he's done it. That's it. His obligation's over. He's shown his love. He doesn't need to do anything else. And when a woman questions his love, he's shocked. Not just he's shocked, he's, in, he's offended. He's insulted. Because to him, he's already providing. He's protecting. Isn't this enough? Aren't these signs of love? This is how a man thinks. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, what a woman wants versus what a man wants. You see, just as men are simple creatures, women are very, very complicated. That's the reality. Because I bet you, till today, no one has figured out what a woman wants. In fact, I don't think they even know what they want. Perhaps right now, today, there's something specific. Tomorrow it changes. What a woman wants is relative. It could easily switch from one thing to another. Whether it's emotionally, financially, socially, it's always different. There's a radio talk show host in Los Angeles by the name of Steve Harvey. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He's very well known in America. He started out as a comedian and then began a radio, uh, radio show. Anyhow, he has a book called Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. It's quite interesting. He says this about women. He says that in reality, and I know that it's, it's, a, it's a joke, but it has some truth to it. It has some wisdom to it. Now, whether it's from Steve Harvey or whatever, wisdom should be taken from anyone. Imam Ali السلام, says, وجد, A woman looks for wisdom. Anyhow, Steve Harvey says that women actually need four men. Four men. Who? He says, well, number one, they need an old guy. The old guy to bring in the cash. The old guy will have a lot of money. Number two, they need an ugly guy. <laughs> the ugly guy will do the work. He'll serve, he'll wash the dishes. 
Why? Because, I mean, he's ugly. He's just happy that you're actually talking to him. You're giving him attention. He'll, he's willing to do anything. Number three, they need a cute guy. Well, I mean, that's obviously, I mean, the, the need for that, that's kind of obvious. And number four, they need a gay guy. The gay guys for going shopping with, gossiping, and all that. So they actually need four. It has some truth to it. I mean, there's a wisdom behind it. That the needs can switch. They're complicated beings. While men, again, they're very simple. They think simply. And their needs and desires are also very simple. Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I can make a generalization, and most likely all men fall into this category that men have three needs. These are the main three needs of men that they require from women. Every man requires three things from his wife. It usually doesn't get more demanding than this. Number one, support. A man needs support. A man lives a tough life outside of his house. He's trying to prove himself. He's playing out a battle. He's battling outside. He's fighting a battle. A battle to prove himself. A battle because he knows he's being judged by other men and members of the community and members of society. He's trying to make a living. Thus, outside of the house, a man is fighting a battle. He always has his guards up. But when he comes at home, he wants to relax. A man wants to put his guards down. He wants to be able to know that at home he has a peace of mind. He has comfort. He has someone to come back to that will support him. Support him in that battle outside of the house. Someone who will stand and encourage him. Who will give him self-esteem and self-confidence. And that person is his wife. A husband expects from his wife to support him in that battle. To stand next to him. And to encourage him, even if it's with a few words, that's all it is. You see, us men, we can be fooled with just a couple of words. Just a couple of words. If a woman says a couple of words, khalas, we're fooled, we buy it, and we go home happy. It's just a few kind words, generous words, words of appreciation, words of support, words of encouragement. That, that's all it takes. A man requires support. And of course, you will say that a woman requires support. Absolutely. A woman also requires support. A woman also wants appreciation. Who doesn't want to be appreciated? Everyone wants to feel appreciated. Whether it's a man or a woman. I agree. A husband must make his wife feel appreciated. Even if, even if it's by saying a simple thank you. We'll talk about this tomorrow, inshallah. The gift and value of appreciation. Or a husband. A husband also wants to hear a thank you once in a while. Or a good job once in a while. A man wants to feel appreciated. Because those few words of appreciation will motivate him to go back outside of the house, battle it, battle it out, and come back home with the bread. He wants to feel appreciated. That is why the famous saying, and I genuinely believe in this, the famous saying that says, behind every great man, there's a great woman. It's true. It's true. You will never find a great man that doesn't have a supportive wife, that has a nagging wife, that has a wife that doesn't support him. It's impossible. It's very impossible. Behind every great man, there's a great wife at home supporting him and encouraging him and pushing him to become better. I assure you. Number one, support. 
Number two, loyalty. A man wants his wife to be loyal to him. In fact, his, wife, his wife's love means loyalty. To a man, love means loyalty. If a wife is not loyal, that means she doesn't love him. Now when I say loyal, I don't, I don't necessarily mean that she, can't, uh, she shouldn't cheat on him. I'm, that's a given. That's a given. I'm not talking about that. Loyalty means making him feel that she married him because of him. Not because of anything else. Not because of how much she owns or where he comes from or who his father is or what sort of position he has. No, she married him because of him. And she will stick to him and with him no matter what. Whether he owned millions or he's in debt in millions. Whether he owns a house or he doesn't own a house. No matter what happens to him, she has to make him feel that she will stick to him and she will stay with him. This is a great feeling. When a man feels this from a woman, he feels like a king. He, re he will really feel like a king. And if you make him feel like a king, he'll give you everything. And number three, and this is very, very obvious, a man requires intimacy. Now, if a man is not receiving these three things, support, loyalty, and intimacy from his wife, and I'm sorry to say this, he will go look for it somewhere else. Because these three things are important to him. He can't live without him. He won't be the person that he is without these three things from his wife. Support, loyalty, and intimacy. Now it's very important for the ladies to know this. And I'm sorry if you don't like what you're hearing, but this is the reality. That if you're not providing this for your husband or for your future husband, he's going to go look for it somewhere else. Because he needs support, he needs loyalty, and he needs intimacy. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The fourth difference. What scares a man? There is one thing that scares a man that women don't know about. Or if they do know about, they tend to ignore it. They act as if it doesn't happen. What scares a man, my dear sisters, is when you tell him, we need to talk. <laughs> this scares a man. No man wants to hear that statement from his woman, whether it's his wife or fiance or future wife. Men don't, just don't want to hear that statement, we need to talk. It scares them. Why? Because it could mean one of two things. It either means that he's in trouble and he's going to get lectured and he's going to hear a speech or a lecture about how he messed up. And which man wants to hear that? Which man wants to sit and hear a lecture by his wife or fiancé about how he messed up? No one wants to hear it. Or even worse, she just wants to sit and chat with him. <laughs> you see, my dear brothers and sisters, as we're children, boys are not encouraged to express themselves. In general, boys are not ex encouraged to express themselves. They're not encouraged to be emotional. Now, I'm not telling you is this right or wrong. This is besides the point. I'm just telling you what reality is. Whether it's in our community <clears throat> or in a, Western, in a Western community. I'm not telling you this is right. But in general, boys are not raised... They're, they're, they are not encouraged to express themselves. They are always told to be strong, be tough, man it out, don't cry, don't be a girl, and so on and so forth. While women, on the other hand, as little girls, they're emotional. They're always asked about their feelings. Thus, obviously, they are encouraged to talk and express themselves. While men, 
or not. That is why when they grow up and they become young men and women, women like to vent. They have things on their chest that they like to get it off. They like to talk. They have something on their chest and they just want to get it off. Even if they're not looking for a solution, sometimes they just want to talk, that's it. Without wanting a solution. While as men, they don't do that. So the best person, my dear sisters, to vent with and to talk to is simply your girlfriend, not the guy. Because the guy, just, he's not into the talking business. He's into the fixing business. Let me, let me give you an example. You go to your friend, you come to your, yeah, you talk to your friend about a problem. And what is that problem? The problem is that you went to a party last night, and this is a huge problem. You went to a party last night, and you saw a lady wearing the same exact dress that you were wearing. <laughs> this is a catastrophe. You'll call your girlfriend, and you can talk about this problem for an hour. And she'll give you solutions and all that. But when you talk to your man and husband, he'll be like, okay, you're back home. I mean, what's the problem now? Problem's over, you're home. You're not looking at her. And she's also home. See, for a man, he's not going to come and discuss, discuss with you the solution. He's not going to sit and discuss and let you vent and chat with him. And let you pour your heart out for him. It's just not in his DNA. The man will tell you this is a solution. Here, and that's it. I'm sure you've seen how women vent. <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen how your mothers talk to their girlfriends. They'll talk for an hour. Your mother's girlfriend will call her. They'll talk for an hour and you can tell that her girlfriend is complaining to her over the phone. And what is the solution that your mother have to offer? Ya soda alayya. Does it get more than that? No. But at the end of the day, even though there is no solution, they feel a lot better. See, you can do that with your girlfriend, but not with the guy. When you tell a guy we need to talk, that scares him. He's going to run away. Not that he hates you. Not that he hates you. He loves you. But he's not in the talking business. He's in the fixing business. It's not in his DNA to sit and chat. It's hard. It's just, we just can't do it. It's not impossible, but it's really hard. So next time you say that he doesn't want to talk to me, he's not opening up, we're having difficulty communicating, it's not you. It's not that he, he doesn't love you. It's not that there's a problem. Men can't talk. They just can't chit-chat. Realize this. And at the same time, men should also understand that it really won't kill them to sit once in a while and talk. Or better yet, just listen. Sometimes a woman wants someone to listen, not to talk. She just wants someone to sit there and listen, and that's it. It won't kill you. Once in a while, it's necessary. You can't, I mean, I know how horrible it is, Sometimes you just can't beat around it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And number five, change. Women love it, men hate it. Change for a man is something very undesirable. Generally, generally speaking, men like consistency. Men usually like the things the way they are. Because if it's something really horrible, he'll do something about it. So if he's not doing something about it, that means he's comfortable with it. He doesn't want to change it. That's why things at home will remain the same. Things at work will remain the same. He'll have the same haircut for 20 years. And so on and so forth. Men are usually complacent. They don't want change. Women, on the other hand, Love change. Without change, life for them would be boring. 
Even if it's something very, very simple. Like at home, they'll take this sofa, put it over there, and the sofa from there, they'll put it over here. It's simple, but it's change. Without it, life will be dull. Life will be boring. It's very simple matters. For a man, it doesn't make any difference. But for a woman, it makes all the difference. It's a huge difference. That's why you'll see a woman, she'll go in and cut her hair, how much? Just by a centimeter. Just by a centimeter. And she'll come in front of her husband, Hayati, what do you think? And he'll be like, um, very lovely, but he has absolutely no idea what she's talking about. Because how dare him, how dare he say that, uh, you know, I don't notice the haircut. But it's that one centimeter that doesn't make a difference to him. It makes all the difference to her because it's changed. Or she'll go into the kitchen. She'll flip everything in the cabinet. Even though there's no need. There's absolutely no need. But just for change. He'll go. He'll look for the salt. Ya bint al-halal. Where's the salt? She'll be like, it's next to the pepper. Well, where's the pepper? And this creates a problem. When a man doesn't want change, and a woman does want change, there'll be a conflict of interest. Know this. Keep this in mind. These are points that are very important to remember. So inshallah, when you guys make the foolish decision of getting married, you'll have at least a happy, successful marriage. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We come to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and Fatima al-Zahra. As we mentioned, the night of their wedding, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, he tells him, Ya Ali, ni'ma al-zawj Fatima. Fatima is the best wife. Know her value. And he tells Fatima al-Zahra, Ya Fatima, ni'ma al-ba'lu Ali. Ali is the best husband. And indeed, they were the best couple. They met the, they, they were the best couple. Fatima al-Zahra was the best wife because she carried out, not just that she carried out her rights, and not that she carried out her duties and responsibilities. There are some women that think being a good wife means doing your duties and responsibilities, and that's it. That's ridiculous. If a man and wife want to live a life of just duties and responsibilities, you do your chores, I do mine. You carry out your duties and I carry out mine. That's it. Well, where's the love? There's no love? Fatima al-Zahra, salamu alayha, she implemented this hadith. Jihad al-mar'ah, husnu al-taba'ul. You see, a man has a jihad and a woman has a jihad. But their jihads are different. The jihad of a man is completely different. It might be physical. But the jihad of a woman is husnu al-taba'ul, being a good wife. If a woman wants to do a good jihad, be excellent in her jihad, she has to be a good wife. A good wife means being supportive, being encouraging of your husband, making him feel worth it, making him feel that the pain that he has to go through to make a living, it's all worth it. In reality, making him feel like a king. Of course, in return, he should also make you feel like a queen. But a good wife makes her husband feel as if he's the most important human being on earth. And that her, and that her life revolves around him. And that she's supportive of him. And she's encouraging of him. And that no matter what, she will stick to his side. No matter what. And she will raise proper Muslim children for him. This is a good wife. Jihad al-mar'a husn al a good wife will make her husband forget all about his problems, all about his issues. And indeed, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was quoted saying that when I had problems, 
When I had difficulties and issues, all I had to do is look at the face of Fatima to Zahra. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You see, he doesn't say I need, I would go and sit and talk to her or have a conversation with her or ask her for advice. No, 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 no. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, when I had problems and difficulties, all I would do is look at the face of Fatima and I would forget everything. And I would be taken into another world. Because her glance, just her glance, was a glance of support. A glance of encouragement. A glance of appreciation. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam came back home and he asked for food. He asked Fatima to Zahra, what do they have to eat? Fatima to Zahra was embarrassed. She said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mini, we haven't had food for two days. We don't have food. For two days, we haven't had food at home. He said, for two days? Why didn't you tell me? She said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mini, I don't wish to burden you. I didn't want to burden you. Because I know if you have, you will provide. You won't hide it. It's not like it's not as if you're taking it somewhere else. You, will, you would provide it. But when you you're, when you're not providing, that means you don't have. I didn't want to burden you, Ya Amir al Imam Sadiq says that Fatima al Zahra and Amir al Mu'mineen would divide the duties of the house. You see, there are some men that think the third duty is outside of the house. But inside the house, everything is on the shoulder of the wife. The cooking, the cleaning, the children, everything else is on the, ch on the shoulder of the wife. This is not right. Imam Sadiq says that the duties of the house were divided by Fatima al-Zahra and Amir al-Mu'mineen. Sometimes Amir al-Mu'mineen would hold a broom and he would sweep, sweep the floor. He would clean the house. Sometimes he would cook himself. And he was honored to do though, honored to do so, because he was serving Fatima al Zahra. Not only was she his wife, but she was the daughter of Rasulullah. And Fatima al and Amir al Mu'minin would never address her as Fatima. He would never address her by his by her first name. He would always call her Ya bint Rasulullah, O daughter of Rasulullah. He would respect her, and she would respect him. She would never call him Ya Ali. She would never call him by his first name. She would always say, Ya ibn al-Am, O oh cousin. She would call him, O oh cousin. Such respect. From day one, Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra had respect for one another. They never disrespected one another. They never crossed the boundary. They loved each other so much that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam after the loss of Fatima al-Zahra Amir al-Mu'mineen collapsed Amir al-Mu'mineen collapsed after the death of Fatima al-Zahra Amir al-Mu'mineen who was a fierce warrior in the battlefield who was known to be one of the most courageous warriors in the battlefield but when he heard news of the death of Fatima he fell on the ground, he couldn't stand he sat, he sat, and he wrote verses of poetry for his wife. <coughs> Have you heard of this? Amir al-Mu'mineen wrote verses of poetry for Fatima al-Zahra. Nafsi ala zafaratiha mahbusatun, ya laytaha kharajat ma'a zafarati, la khayra ba'daka fi al-hayat. وَإِنَّمَا أَبْكِي مَخَافَةَ أَن تَطُولُ حَيَاتِي O oh, Fatima, there is no good in life after you. And I cry because I, I am afraid I will live for many years after you. I don't want to live for too many years after you. There's a narration that at the end, towards the end of the life of Amir al mumini when Fatima al-Zahra died, Imam Ali was 30 years old. 
Imam Ali died at the age of 63. That means he lived 33 years after the death of Fatima al-Zahra. Towards the end of his life, read Nahj al balagha Towards the end of Nahj al balagha this hadith is there. One day, Imam Ali salam, a group of his companions were sitting with him and they told him, Ya Amir al mumini dye your beard. Dye your beard. Or put some perfume on. Amir al mumini refused. He refused to dye his beard. His beard was all white. He refused to dye his beard. They asked him why. He said, لا زلنا في عزاب. I am still mourning Fatima al-Zahra. After 33 years, Amir al-Mu'mineen was still mourning Fatima al-Zahra. This is love. This is genuine love. Ammar ibn Yasir says that many months after the death of Fatima al-Zahra, I came in the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen. I saw Amir al-Mu'mineen sitting on the ground sitting on the floor, on the dusty floor, crying, weeping, and his children are, are sitting around him. Al-Hassan, wa Hussein, wa Zainab, wa Umma Kulthum, wa Ruqayya, they're sitting around him. He's sitting on the ground, he's crying, and the children are crying with him. Ammar says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, anta asbaru al-sabirin. You are the most patient person. Why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you doing this to your, this to your children, Ya Amir al mumini We seek, you are our motivation and patience. We learn patience from you. Why are you doing this? He said, Ya Ammar, don't blame me. Don't blame me. When I was, when I was washing the body of Fatima, Fatima al-Zahra did not tell me a secret. She had a secret in her heart that she did not tell me about. I discovered it while I was washing her body. As I was washing her body, my hand was going over her chest. All of a sudden, I felt a broken rib in her chest. I realized why Fatima al-Zahra was in such great pain. So don't blame me if I sit and cry, Ya Amma. Tonight, Let's go to the house of Fatima al-Zahra, the dark house of Fatima al-Zahra, the lonely house of Fatima al-Zahra. A night like this, all you could hear is the crying of Al-Hassan, wal Hussein, and Zainab, crying for their mother, asking for their mother. Come with me as I take you to the house of Fatima al-Zahra. As Imam Ali stands in the middle of the night to wash the body, the pure body of Fatima al-Zahra. During the day, the Sahaba come to the house of Amir al mumineen They ask about the time, when is the burial? Amir al mumineen tells his son Al-Hassan to go and tell them that it's delayed till tomorrow. Because you heard her will last night. Fatima al-Zahra asked Amir al mumineen that no one participates in her funeral. No one participates in her burial except her immediate family members. And she asked Amir al mumineen to bury her at night when all eyes are shut. No one sees her grave. No one sees her burial. When everyone was asleep, Amir al mumineen got up in the middle of the night along with Asma bint Umais he put, the, he put the body of Fatima al-Zahra on the Mukhtasal to wash her body one, for the last time. Amir al muminin poured the water on the body of Fatima al-Zahra as he's washing. Asma bin Umay says, all of a sudden I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib sit. He could no longer stand. He sat on the ground. I asked him, Sayyidi wa Mawla, Ya Amir al muminin what is wrong? He said, Ya Asma, as my hand was going over her chest, I felt the broken rib in her body. Ya Asma, Fatima never told me about this broken rib. I discovered about this, I discovered about it right now. As he washed her, as he shrouded her, he put on the kefen before taking her out to the graveyard. Before he buried her, he said, Ya Hassan wa Ya Hussein, 
ويا زينب ويا أم كلثوم ويا رقية هلما وودعوا أمكما فاطمة My children come and say your last farewell to your mother Fatima they came these little children threw themselves on the on the body of Fatima al Zahra they threw themselves yumma yumma ya yumma they threw themselves al Hassan wal Hussein wa Zainab they threw themselves on the body of Fatima Amir al Mu'minin says ashhadu wal ashhadu billah أشهد بالله إنها حنت وأنت وأخرجت يديها وضمتهما إلى صدرها By God, I swear that she started crying She started wailing and she took out her hands and she hugged her children Imam Ali says all of a sudden I heard a voice coming from the sky يا علي ارفعهما فَهُمَا وَاللَّهَ قَدْ أَبْكَيَا مَلَائِكَةَ السَّمَاءِ Oh Ali, lift the children from the chest of Fatima. They have made the angels of the sky weep and cry for them. Finally, Amir al-Mu'mineen and seven members, seven from his Shia, Salman, Abu Dhar, al-Maqdad, al-Zubayr, al-Hassan, wal Hussein. They take Fatima al-Zahra to her last abode, to her last house. They take her to, their, to her grave. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam digs that grave. He goes inside with Fatima into her grave. He puts Fatima in her grave. He comes out. He comes out, he pours the dirt, he pours the sand on the grave. The hadith says, فَهَاجَ بِهِ الْحُزْنِ All of a sudden, sadness, sadness takes over the heart of Amir al-Mu'mineen. I have finally lost Fatima. Fatima is gone. He looks towards the grave of Rasulullah and he's the only one that he can complain to. He can only complain to her, her father Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Anni wa an ibnatika al nazilati fi jiwarik. Assalamu <laughs> وفادح مصيبتك موضع تعزي O oh, peace upon you, O oh, Rasulullah Upon you and on your daughter that is your guest tonight Ya Rasulullah Laqad isturjaat al-wadi'a وأخذت الرهينة واختلست الزهراء يا رسول الله Remember on the night of my wedding with Fatima, you trusted me with Fatima. You told me, Ya Ali, هذه وديعتي عندك يا رسول الله, I'm giving you back what you trusted me on the night of my wedding. I'm giving, it, I'm giving her back to you. But Ya Rasul Allah, one more point. I'm embarrassed of you, Ya Rasulullah. The night of my wedding, Fatima Zahra was healthy, she was safe, she was sound. But tonight she's coming back to you with a broken rib, Ya Rasulullah. Please forgive me. Amma huzni fasarmad wa amma layli famusahad ila an yakhtar Allah لدارك التي أنت بها مقيم فبعين الله تدفن ابنتك السراء 
ويهتضم حقها قهرا يا رسول الله we are burying your daughter at night ask her what your umma has done to her how they have oppressed her Amir al-Mu'mineen sits on the grave of Fatima al-Zahra he weeps, he cries, he recites Quran and then finally he goes back home when he goes back home as soon as he's about to inside, as, he, as he's about to go inside his house, Amir al muminin stops at the doorsteps and he looks at the door. He looks at the door and he puts his forehead on that door, remembering what happened on that day, remembering how his wife was crushed in between the door and the wall. Haja bihi al-huzd. Amir al muminin remembered that tragedy of how they broke the rib of his wife Fatima al-Zahra I say Sayyidi wa Mawla Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen when you were washing your wife Fatima al-Zahra you noticed that she had a broken rib Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen you could no longer stand you had to sit why because you saw one broken rib from Fatima al-Zahra Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I wish you were at the land of Karbala to see all the broken ribs of Imam Hussein. Hayyatul Hussein ala thara Khaylul Ida Tahanat Zuluha. Umar bin Sa'ad ordered 10 of his soldiers to ride, over, to ride on their horses and to trample the body of Imam Hussein, his chest, while he was alive. He was looking at them as they were riding, stamping over his chest with their, so, with their horses. <laughs> Sayyidah Zainab comes to, the great, to, comes to the body of her brother Hussein. After they beheaded him, after every single rib in his chest was broken, she comes to his body. She puts her hands under, under his body, and she says, "Allahumma inna hada al Hussein ibn Ali, inna hada al Hussein ibn Ali, qurban Nabiyyik Muhammad." اللهم فتقبله بأحسن القبول. Now I want you to help me with this. يا جدي هذا حسين ما ذبح. بارك الله بارك الله. يا جدي هذا حسين ما ذبح سليب وعلى التربان ما طروح وين اللي يساعدني ويجي نوح قلبي على فرقه مجروح لسان حال زينب and I end with this just few verses of poetry and I conclude say the Zainab Umm al-Masaib look at how she says that I saw two tragedies I saw the tragedy of my mother Fatima and I saw them and I saw the tragedy of my brother Hussein listen to this نار حرقت خيمتنا 
ونار حرقت باب الدار وانا اللي شفت ضلعن وانا اللي شفت ضلعن واحد صوب المسمار واحد كربلت خبره شلون الخير